I thought you sent me a message first. Oh, did I? And you were like, hey. I oh, maybe I did. Yeah, and I and I said, uh, and then we chatted a little bit, and then I said, I'm surprised because you sort of look like this kind of uber liberal anarchist dude, and and you said, yeah, well, I've sort of evolved somewhat from those kinds of positions, and and I was chuffed, which is a really British way of saying that I was I was happy that somebody who I thought had probably looked like they had very different political views from my own uh, reached out. Although you tend to have quite you know omnivorous tastes on Twitter. You do follow a lot of different kinds of people. Yeah, I'm promiscuous. You're intellectually that, promiscuous. Now that you mention it, yeah, you're totally right. I re- I saw you on Twitter, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh, this person is at Portsmouth. It's like yeah. right around the corner. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I reached out to you. But thank you for being open to that. Yeah. Some people are weird about, like, reaching out online, like, people you don't know. Some people find it, like, not cool. Well, I had uh, to follow you back before you could message me, because women who leave their direct messages open right. on Twitter get a lot of unwanted attention. Yeah, I totally understand that, but thanks for not thinking I was like a creep no, or something. No, 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 no. Yeah. Although I met my best friend in, in London, my friend Els on Twitter. Um, when you first get on Twitter, Twitter will tell you who's like you so that you can follow them, which is kind right. of funny because why would you want to follow people who are like you? But it said she's like me and she is like me. So she's really into anthropology and evolution and she's vegan um, and she's got colorful hair. Not that I do really. And so I asked her to hang out I think immediately, as soon as I saw her, and then she thought I was asking her out, and she asked a bunch of people if I was asking her out, I was like, no, I just <laughs> just thought you looked interesting. I mean, I might have been asking you out, but in this particular case, I wasn't. So yeah, um, <laughs> she's, been my, she's been my really good friend for three years, which is sad that Facebook isn't a way that you can really meet people to hang out with anymore. Yeah, Facebook sucks. I th- I'm a big fan of like social media being used aggressively to make relationships. And it's sad that it's not used more like that, you know? Yeah. Like, what we, like, you and I making friends online and then becoming, you know, friends and hanging out and doing podcasts and stuff like that. Yeah. There's no reason everyone can't just basically scour the web for people that they're interested in for any reason and basically sort of hang out hang out with them and sort of do that more often. But some a lot of people don't do that. That's, like, a pretty abnormal thing to do. I think... Uh, so, so I dated a guy for a couple of years named Rob Wiblin and, and Rob has a blog and a lot of the people that he hung out with, even people he stayed on couches with and stuff all over the world were people that liked his blog. And so if you have a popular enough blog and you're young and have no money, you can actually milk that for quite a lot. But I was so desperate to make friends down here, you know, down South that, uh, I tried all kinds of tactics when I first moved to Portsmouth. So... Uh, even though I wasn't that interested in meeting a romantic partner, I did try to date in Portsmouth. That didn't really work very well. I also messaged women on OkCupid who were saying that they were looking for friends. Spoiler (laughs) alert, no one's actually looking for friends on OkCupid. But I did message a few women on there and said, oh, we actually are a high match. We would be good friends. And they were like, yeah, that sounds great. And then they never got back to me. And then I went to a meditation, a Tuesday night meditation in Portsmouth one time. Because I'm into meditation. Oh, we can talk about meditation later. Actually. Right. Yeah. So anyway, I went to a, a Zen meditation. It seemed really great. I got there. I introduced myself to a bunch of people, and they were all recovering drug addicts. Not that there's anything wrong with that, mm. but they were not the kind of usual intellectual bougie people that I <laughs> not your milieu. Yeah. <laughs> with being into meditation. Yeah. So yeah, it's cool to meet somebody within a 45 minute train ride. Right. Right. So you had said before when we were talking before the, we started recording. That you're, you wanted to talk a little bit more about how we met on Twitter and what that, you know, what yeah. what what are you interested in about that, like Twitter as a as a way of actually making relationships. Well, I think it's kind of based on interests, and unfortunately, I think Facebook is not so much about advertising your interests as it is advertising details of your personal life to people that you already know. Uh, somebody made some kind of joke on my Twitter that said Facebook. Uh, Twitter is a, a way of getting to know people that you might like, and Facebook is a way of hating people you already know. Whoa. <laughs> that's <laughs> <And> dark. <laughs> it's a little dark. But I do think that that's, uh, that's why I don't spend very much time on there anymore. Uh, because, And also because if I advertise, my political views have changed you know, quite a lot in the last few years. And if I give my honest opinion, which is generally nuanced and generally more right than it used to be, I will upset people who were friends of mine in America, and I will also tend to just alienate everybody because my opinions on things are pretty pretty nuanced. Carrie Howley, who's a really f- 
she's a, she's a um, great writer and she's a liber she's libertarianish anyway. Um, what did she say? She said that even if you and your family all voted against Trump in the in the election, you can still argue about how alarmed you should be. And that's exactly kind of what happens when I try and say, like, everybody should chill out. It's not that big a deal. People, right. people get offended at me like I'm in some way responsible. People just are very keen to punish. Yeah, for About sure. these kind of political views. And so that's why, even on Twitter, I mean, Twitter people feel like punishing me, but not as much as people I already know. Right. Interesting. So, okay. So for listeners who maybe don't know about your work or what kinds of things you're interested in online oh. or, or else, yeah. elsewise, um, how, how would you sort of briefly describe your kind of uh, place in the, in the, in the social media verse or the Twitter verse? Oh yeah. It's sort of like, I would, I mean, how about this? I'll give you my impression. Oh, yeah. and maybe that'll be interesting. That. <laughs> that'll be interesting to sort of like break down because maybe I'm, I'm biased or mistaken in a certain way. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that you're sort of broadly in sort of libertarian circles, mm -hmm. um, very sort of, um, uh, utilitarian, uh, psych psychological, um, and kind of like that, kind of like, uh, how do I put it? Um, w like what would be the term that sort of, uh, is it the middle of the Venn diagram between the, the, the effective altruism stuff, right? The like Darwinism stuff, the atheism stuff. Like, what is that? What is that? Like, what is that uh, term for the center of that Venn diagram? Cause I feel like that's a thing, you know, I don't know. maybe it's just libertarian. Would you do, do you like that description or no? Libertarians all tend to be into science and I know a lot of libertarians who are in evolutionary psychology I know a lot of evolutionary psychologists who are libertarian, but I think there's more kind of overlap with libertarians being atheist and into evolutionary psychology mm. than evolutionary psychologists being into libertarianism. Okay. Almost all evolutionary psychologists are atheists. Right. Except I have a colleague who's Christian who's an evolutionary psychologist, which is kind of interesting. I think he's more of a... I think he's, a, he's quite culturally Christian, which I actually don't have any... What is, I have no, I have not only do I have no problem with it, I used to be quite a strident atheist and now I actually think there's just so many benefits to religiosity that if I could kind of turn back and believe things that I don't believe now, I don't know if I would be tempted to because I've, I'm so strongly identified with being an atheist at this point. But so yeah, so I'm a, I'm an evolutionary psychologist. I started my Twitter called sentientist and that was when I was kind of first vegan and the big thing I was talking about at that time was how I thought that insentient organisms like mussels and oysters uh, could be eaten. That sentience was actually what mattered rather than intelligence or what kingdom of taxonomy. So I mm. definitely hear from vegans who say things like, oh, mussels and oysters are in the kingdom animalia, therefore you can't eat them. I said, yeah, but taxonomists were not trying to think of suffering when they made the taxonomies of, of animals and plants. So I started tweeting mostly about kind of animal rights stuff and about animal cognition. And that's where sentientist comes from. But now it's just kind of my handle for everything. And I feel a little bit bad for taking sentientist because I do think that there should be some kind of on message person called sentientist who only talks about how sentience is an important matter in terms of utilitarianism. Mm. So it's very important whether animals are, super, are sentient or not in terms of, you know, not being used as objects or not being, no, or not suffering. Uh, but now I'm using it for all of these different kinds of things that I tweet about. Well, you could make a new account for yourself and then make your current handle yeah. like yeah. a bot that just, <laughs> that just, <laughs> that just like a, puts out like a pre-programmed Well, now uh, I've got so much invested. Just, and also, every time I had handles with my name, which is ridiculously long, it just didn't seem didn't seem that good. Mm. Diana Fleischman is a very long name. Mm. It's 15 characters. Yeah, I think I mentioned last time we hung out that my, my I have a very specific style or way of doing social media, mm -hmm. which is I do it all offline, and then I just uh, program the stuff to go out yeah. on a regular schedule. So I'm actually... To the, to the average person watching my social media, it looks like I'm on all the time and I'm posting stuff all the time, but I'm actually never on social media. Almost well, if ever. Not, if you're not replying to stuff in real time. So I think that's important to do. And I took a page from you when you told me that because you say you post stuff and then you sign off. Well, the so in terms of behaviorism, the closer in proximity or, or reinforcement or a punishment is 
the more effective it is. Mm. And so what I often do is I'll post something and then I'll refresh and refresh and refresh. And then I'm getting a little kind of hit of dopamine uh-huh. every time I see something retweeted or liked. Right. right. And that's very, very much in proximity with posting. Yeah. And it especially happens when I'm trying to avoid doing something that has a kind of more long term reward. Right. So in, in academia, our rewards are very distal. It's very, very difficult. I've, I've even made a joke that submitting a paper to a journal should feel at least as good as an orgasm, if not a foot massage. Like it should feel good when you press submit, but it doesn't, it just feels like, Oh fuck. I'm so tired. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Right. And so with Twitter, it's just really designed to have this addictive property. And you seem to have kind of broken that cycle by doing everything offline. And, uh, yeah, I'm trying to get away from that dopamine IV. Yes. As much as like, I'm trying to break it completely. Like I want to have no dopamine IV whatsoever. I, I actually like more and more, I mean, it's, it's very, it's, it's actually like a very Zen kind of idea, but, uh, I try to do, I try to do nothing for like the, uh, extrinsic reward or benefit. I try to, as much as possible, disconnect completely from expectations of rewards and just try to put basically all of my focus into making the actual activities themselves inherently worthwhile. That's really good. And I try to basically organize everything I do to that effect. Um, so to the point that I, I almost like, I, I don't ever go on social media. I like to, I you like it as a platform to write what I think and to share it with people and to make connections. But I'll do, I do, I usually do like one, I'll do like a one day a week where I do social media stuff where I like, inter, where I like respond to people, whatever. Cause I do believe in relationships and making connections. I'm, I'm, I'm well game for that. But the idea of like checking it or even getting, like I try to deny myself the dopamine hit of like the pleasure you get from like a, getting retweeted or something like that. Yeah. I try to actively not allow myself to have that pleasure because I think it's like, uh, ultimately it fucks with like long, it fucks with your, it really, really fucks with your capacity to do long-term serious thinking. It's candy. Like that's really creative and because to, to really like do and to really think anything worthwhile, you have to be like so completely disconnected from reward and punishment mechanisms, I think. Um, so yeah. And I think it also just makes for like a better life. If everything you're doing, you're doing because of the joy that it gives you. And it's cause that forces you to do it in a way that gives you joy. You know, what, what is interesting about social media is like when you're on that dopamine IV, it actually enables you to have a shitty life <laughs> because like you can, you can spend most of your hours of most days doing shit that makes you miserable because you have this little dopamine IV that gets you through it. But if you're not lo- allowing yourself to have that dopamine IV at all, you like have to, you have to have a good life because <laughs> there's no way to sort of like, you, you, ha- you have to challenge yourself to make your life worth living because there's no like sort of easy way to get by on a daily basis with these like little hits. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. Yeah. In terms of, so in terms of re- reinforcement that is very, very quick, if you're not getting quick reinforcement, then by comparison, any kind of long-term distal reinforcement is going to seem painful and mm, punishing yeah. by comparison. And so kind of what you're talking about, which is often how I think about it, is social media as kind of candy, which is if you eat candy all the time, then nothing else is going to taste sweet in comparison. Whereas if you don't eat candy and you deny yourself that, or you deny yourself experiences that are very proximately rewarding, like social media, then you can develop a taste for things that are kind of more distally reinforced. They do the same thing with drug dogs. Drug dogs only get pet and they only get a treat and they only get to play with a dog when they've sniffed drugs. And if you pet them mm-hmm. randomly, they actually get very confused and they go off their job. So huh. it's, it, it is a way of engineering. But I think more than Zen, what you're saying you do is sort of stoical, is that mm. you are trying to, as much as possible, insulate yourself from the highs and lows of everyday life and that's super important if you want to have long-term goals in mind. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for sure. For sure. Um, yeah. And you know, it, it occurs to me actually that it's interesting and pretty valuable, I think, to be transparent about this because something I've thought about for a while is something that's really fucked up about social media is the people who are powerful on social media, the, the you know, the influencers or whatever, they're going to be relatively good at managing this dopamine problem and being able to cultivate long-term serious creative projects offline. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but they benefit from all the people who can't do that. So there's this fucked up sort of relationship, I think between, you know, people who have power on social media and those who don't because, and that's why I'm trying to be transparent about it because like I look like I'm on social media all the time, but I, I actually, I don't want to, what am I trying to say? Like, People and people who are powerful on social media, it's like they secretly want 
all of their followers to be wasting their time on yeah. social media. Yeah. Whereas I would rather not have followers. Like I don't, like I don't want like a big audience that like loves me and is constantly wasting their life like reading what I write. I want I, that. <laughs> and some people do. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Um, I think of more like I do desire a kind of like uh, horizontal kind of re- like community of. Uh, interesting people and thinkers and, and communicators. Yeah. And I, so in that sense, I do want an audience. Like the reason I'm doing something like a podcast or the reason I do write online is because I, I do have some sort of drive and desire for a large number of interesting people online to, to hear what I'm saying, but also to, to speak back to me. But what I'm getting at is that like, there's this really fucked up thing where, uh, social media benefits people who can stay off of it for long periods of time. In, who can do things that then are worthwhile putting on social media, right? Yeah. Um, but it, in this, when it's not talked about, it's like people who have that capacity to kind of like defer gratification yeah. and do interesting things offline, their social media presence sort of like welcomes other people to just be in this sort of like uh, constant state of reactivity. And I think that's fucked up. Like I think it's fucked up to uh, cultivate an audience of people who like can't do long-term creative projects on their own because they're too busy retweeting my shit. You know, like, I don't want wow. people to be doing that. But I think a lot of people do want that, and that's fucked up. Mm, so, yeah, people want that, and there are people who... So, I think that if you want influence, you have to consider, why do you want influence? Do you think your ideas are good? Mm. That they should have influence? And I want influence because everyone is fucking wrong, and I'm right. <laughs> right? Well, I think that you have really nuanced views, and I have somewhat nuanced views. And so I think that it's... I like having influence because I do think my ideas are good, but somebody who has influence and they post lots of pictures of themselves in beautiful clothes, the kind of influence that they're having is promoting, uh, you know, materialism and they're not thinking of it that way. They're thinking that other people are getting enjoyment and, and they are getting enjoyment in that way, but it's the same kind of way that, you know, if you were, you could talk about it like being a drug dealer. And, and so, so Rob Wiblin, who I dated for a long time and who his, he's got a kind of well-known Facebook feed. He's got a lot of people. And I went to a, went to a award ceremony where he was getting an award. And as he was going up to get his award, this guy behind me goes, this is Australia. He goes, this guy's got a great Facebook feed. <laughs> uh, and so people were talking about his Facebook, uh, you know, while he was there. And so um, in order to post stuff, he puts stuff on Buffer as well. And he actually never checks his newsfeed at all. He doesn't actually like anyone else's posts. So he compares himself to a drug dealer who sells drugs but never does drugs. Yeah, I like that. That's how I try to be, yeah. Well, yeah, that's how you're trying to be, but you also don't want to people to be too addicted to what you are peddling. Right, so but he did. Well, he doesn't... He, <laughs> he thinks that people are you know, making their own decisions and sure. he's not responsible for that. Although, I mean, I think if I put it to him this way, he, he might change his mind. <laughs> you, uh, yeah, don't. So this is also the thing that I, I consider. Um, there are things that I know that if I can kind of tweak somebody's outrage, I could make some, I could tweet something really, really popular. Right. right? So if you attack people who are ultra conservative or if you attack so-called social justice warriors, or if you attack, whoever, you know, paleo conservatives, then a lot of people will like that because it's going to juice your outrage mechanisms right. yeah, and you're yeah. talking about the least nuanced view possible. So it's very easy to, to caricature that even if nobody would like that really exists, but people really enjoy that. They really enjoy feeling outraged at this kind of fringe group, but it may not even exist. And so I think in that case, you are sort of juicing people's mechanisms and mm. from a utilitarian perspective, I'm not sure if that's wrong to do because on the one hand, yes, maybe these people could actually do something more worthwhile with their lives, but they're also really enjoying themselves. Mm. And back to your point about people who are on social media all the time and, but who actually really get a lot of things done, you know, how they might have better self-control. I do think that there's people who just have greater G or greater IQ who actually can probably do really important stuff and fuck around on social media a lot. Okay, and, fair enough. I mean, yeah. so is that, does that describe you, kind of? Do you seem like that kind of style? Uh, like, you're obviously high-functioning, very productive, disciplined, but you're also on social media a lot, right? <laughs> is that fair to say? Well, it, it depends. So I've taken all, I've taken Twitter and I've taken Facebook off my phone, so that I, that's, because that was like the most ready delivery device, and now I've stopped doing that. Um, I can be very disciplined and very productive. There are periods of time where I don't know where the time goes. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I, I have a lot of projects that are undone. 
Uh, I have a lot of data unanalyzed, <laughs> yeah. as as do most academics. So I think that we are always sort of haunted by the ghosts of you revise and resubmits we've never done. Or, sure, sure. Yeah. So I, I think you're totally right that there are sort of high IQ, uh, very productive people who can do a lot of focused, disciplined, creative work and also be on, on social media a fair, fairly often. But I think that's quite rare. I mean, it exists. Like, I think the bulk of people, at least that I am that I can see, um, I think the bulk of people who are on social media, like, especially, like, the, you know, the keyboard warriors, you know, like, the, especially, like, the social justice ones. Yes. I mean, I, I do think that there's a serious problem. And I say this out of love. I say this out, seriously out of, like, comrade, comradely spirit. Like, I think there's a serious problem where, like, it becomes a substitute for actually being able to do serious personal projects. Yeah. Um, and I think there is a serious trade-off. And that's why, like, I, that's why I want to be, like, very transparent about, like, um, about that. Because I'm not trying to do that. Uh, I'm not trying to have this kind of, like, constantly reactive online social media sort of life. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to make it look like I have that and trick my, like, friends or potential followers or whatever you want to call them into, like ha- living that kind of way, yeah. Well, not only that, when you when you are engaging in these kinds of behaviors all the time, then you are consciously or unconsciously trying to do things that are going to be the most popular and the things that are going to appeal to mm. a very short attention span. So I saw a very good post the other day where somebody was posting about what past generations have said about the current generation's attention span. Mm. And I think that, you know, even if you were moving from looking at books to looking at newspaper articles, people might have thought that that was a big step down intellectually. And from intellectually, mm. you know, from from newspaper articles and magazine articles now to 140 characters, that seems really shallow as well. So it is really difficult. Although I have to say, I just get so much pleasure out of seeing a tailored stream of memes that are tailored to my preferences and it is just delicious, obviously. Uh, I just think, yeah, dipping into that stream all the time is dangerous. Oh, so this reminds me, we originally were talking about, um, like, how, because we, we, so we've only hung out twice. We've this only had, like, two conversations. Yeah. Really, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so we mostly know each other through, like, our web presences. So I, I wanted to hear from you, like, how, how, do, how do, like, how do you place me? Like, how do you locate me, like, in the Twitterverse, like... When you see my stuff or my what I write or like whatever you've like browsed, like yeah. remember I tried to kind of like describe you. All right, we just took a little break. I had to take a leak, but now I'm back. <laughs> um, ready to roll. So I was just gonna say what I thought about you, and so yeah, I looked at your at your twitters, and uh, and then I saw you had this this Instagram where you had posted a video of you on mushrooms, and I was like, an academic who's also quite an open psychonaut. Mm. You've heard psychonaut, before. I guess, yeah. And, and I just thought you had balls. Well, I mean, it's easy to have balls when you have tenure after a year. Yeah. It's less, yeah. It's less easy to have balls when it takes six years to get tenure. Yeah. yeah. To be fair, it took three. <laughs> probation. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so the, I, I only had a year of probation and I'm permanent. Tenure does mean something a little different here. It's not quite as bulletproof as it is in the States. Well, it's not even a thing here, is it? It's like not a word they use. Well, to, so if somebody says, are you tenured? I would say yes, because by all intents and purposes, from a United States perspective, I am. Because right. I'm permanent, and they they can't get rid of me. Unless, right. I mean, I was told the kinds of things I could be gotten rid of for, and they're right. similar to the kinds of things that you get rid of, you know, somebody right, gets rid of you for if you have tenure. Um, so, yeah, I just thought you were, yeah, I just thought you were super ballsy, and I also thought that you were, had quite a nuanced view. And then you told me a little bit about, you know, how you had this history with Occupy Wall Street and social justice and equality and stuff like that. And, uh, and for somebody like you to kind of turn around and say, I agree with a lot of the stuff that you say, I just thought that, that you must have had some kind of journey similar to what I've had. Right. Well, I've, I've just become very interested in like the weird ideological fractures that you can find online nowadays. I think there's this super interesting thing going on right now. Well, it's probably been going on for a while, but I think it's really intensified recently with Trump and Brexit and these sort of big events that have really confused and kind of scrambled people's expectations and that are kind of ideologically scrambling somewhat. I think there's been this... I, I feel like it since th- those things have happened, people are realizing that l- sort of the traditional ideological coordinates that once upon a time 
were kind of large mass structures that most people in society did kind of use to organize their attitudes and opinions, that those, those mass structures have collapsed. And not that, not that traditional partisan dimension is not still relevant. It is. Of course it is. We know this from research. But there is this newfound liberty whereby people are fracturing rather aggressively. So, like, people are, you know, and I think this is how you explain this, like, the use of the word, like, alt-right that everyone is using and whatever. These, like, that's kind of, like, naming this anxiety around what is actually just, like, a massive fracturing. Some of which is, like, ugly and bad. Some of which is uh, not nece- is not necessarily ugly and bad, and I'm just very interested in that 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 fracturing. So to me, the the internet right now is actually if you know how to play it and you know where to look and you know how to look, it's actually like a really interesting and exciting kind of moment um, because people are taking the liberty to basically go off into all these different uh, sort of uh, niches. Niches, yeah, and it, and it's fascinating. So I kind of recently have had this this sort of epiphany, I guess you could call it. Where, like, I have, since Occupy, I've been kind of just implicitly kind of in this, like, m- overarching kind of, like, lefty social justice kind of, like, dimension. Um, because that's sort of structured sociologically and ideologically, ha- like, who I talk with and who I do things with since Occupy. How I thought about myself, your identity, whatever it might be. Um, I've been kind of, like, leaning on that sort of large left kind of dimension and I'm sort of realizing that there's just no need to do that really anymore. Um, sometimes there is. Like sometimes like in Occupy, for instance, like when you're in a massive thing that's going on and you do need to organize, you know, and constrain your ideology and your thinking along certain dimensions for, for organizational purposes, right? Just to be able to kind of like locate the people around you in a, in a kind of dynamic, complicated situation. Ideological simplifications can make a lot of sense. Um, also for things like solidarity or whatever. But now, with, like, things getting so crazy and, and a lot of things going in a bad direction that a lot of people, you know, right-wing people see that in a very different way and left, than left-wing people, but left and right-wing people today seem to be agreed that, like, you know, shit is fucked up and seems to be getting worse, do you know what I mean? Um, so, I, I, some people, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's not, I don't mean to generalize. Um, anyway, where I'm going with this is that now it seems to me that the gains from these sort of, like, ideological simplifications and solidarities um, are far out, are being far outweighed by the, the costs of the confusion and the stupidity and just the, the erroneous sort of thinking and behaviors that come, up, come about through that ideological kind of mass structuring and simplification. So now I'm just, like, I'm going to go into all of the tiny little niches that I'm interested in, mm. and I'm going to piece together, like, whatever the fuck kind of personal yeah. ideology and sociological kind of community, like, you know, uh, com- communities or networks that I, that I want to. So for me, I'm like, now I'm into like, um, I'm, I'm quite sympathetic to religion and I have kind of like an, a complicated relationship or attitude towards it, but I am interested in, ex- in, in exploring that more. So I'm like pretty deep in like the like Christian, like anarchist, like Twitterverse and stuff like this. And yeah, but I'm also like kind of sympathetic to some libertarian cause I'm, I'm basically like a left libertarian sort of. Um, so there's no reason I can't go scouring for like the cool, you know, smart, uh, right wing people on on the libertarian wing, and find like the ones that I think are at least doing things that are interesting. But whether I agree or not, I don't know. But there's no reason I can't go try to find what cool or good stuff they have they have their finger on, you know. Yeah. And I think that there's like this on the left. There's this massive allergy to like it's just, it, it. I really don't know how to describe it other than an allergy. It's like people on the left. There's this very widespread thing where like you're just seeing you. you you feel like you're not allowed to even associate with uh, it seems people, like people outside feel like of there's it. There's slippery slopes everywhere. So if you agree on any kind of nuance that might actually piss you with the right, then people get really upset with you. So I think that since Trump and since Brexit, that because there's this external threat, there's this signaling of solidarity among uh, lefties. But among lefties, there are some really extreme opinions that people are unwilling to compromise on. So you have to subscribe to a bunch of different edicts. Right. Otherwise, you're kind of not with us. You're it, not in the club. It reminds me of it reminds me of the you know I was heavily involved in the vegan movement for a long time, and it reminds me quite a lot of that where 
you have to subscribe to some pretty unnuanced, pretty mainline stuff in order to be part of that movement. And so I've seen this a lot lately with uh, the Science March. There's this thing called the Science March. It's going to happen on April 22nd. And initially it was said to be uh, anti-colonialist, anti-racist, uh, pro-intersectionality, all these different things. And so it just seemed like a sort of Women's March redux. It actually didn't seem that much to be about science and the promotion of science. And when it was about the promotion of science, it had these very kind of milk toast things that they were saying, you know, like science is important and we should, we should like science and we should promote science publicly. So it didn't really seem to have a message. And then they kind of backed away from all this intersectionality kind of stuff. I mean, intersectionality is an interesting lens with which to view the world, but it's not predictive of anything. Nobody would ever say, I actually can predict the outcomes of various different racial and ethnic groups based on intersectionality. And that was one of the points that I was trying to make, is that through the lens of intersectionality, you would predict that East Asian women would be doing very badly in terms of income and success mm -hmm. and things in the United States, but they actually do uh, better than most groups. And so that's, you know, that's not what you'd expect, even that they're, they're minorities, et cetera. And it, anyway, so, yeah. so now they've kind of backed away from that, but those are the people that they initially courted. So now there's like alt science March and people are essentially saying, you know, if you don't think that discrimination, colonialism and intersectionality are important drivers and social forces, even though these things actually don't really have very much scientific evidence behind them in terms of being causal factors in what happens, then you are against us. And that kind of push against people like me who have more nuanced views about these things, I would actually have been more on board with the left and their movement if they didn't say, if you don't, you know, believe intersectionality is important, then fuck you. And there's a lot of that going on right now because of that external threat that yeah. the left has become even more reactive. You know, during Obama, I don't remember seeing this kind of stuff, but also more and more people have left the left. So the left seems to be more... Yeah, um, just yeah, more hardline than than ever before. Yeah. I, but also yeah. because of the sloughing off of people who have nuanced views. That is true. That's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's good. Like, I think I think we should embrace the the increasing fracturing of ideas, or at least it, what appears to me to be an increasing fracturing. I think something that I've realized recently that a lot of people haven't quite fully intuited is how much like there's no mass media anymore at all, really. Mm -hmm. I think, again, I think this has been happening for a while, but people on the left and the right love, have, have always loved and still continue to sort of lambast, you know, like the ideological slants of the mass media, right? The right wing people think the, the mass media is biased to the left and, and vice versa. But the really radical thing right now is I think that like trust in media has been decreasing so steadily in the wealthy liberal democracies that we, we imagine that there's like this like mainstream set of ideas that are like the normal respectable ideas and that everyone else is kind of like refers to them. Um, you know, like main, like mainstream ideology or mainstream thinking or mainstream media or whatever. Um, but it really, really doesn't exist anymore. And I think I'm only really starting to realize like no one thinks the same thing anymore. That's, you know, when, like when at you all. were saying mainstream ideas, I was like, like what? <laughs> I couldn't actually think of anything off the off the top of my head that would be mainstream. Well, in the in like radical circles, it's very common to think of like you know we are like radicals with like crazy kind of fringe critical ideas about how society functions and what society represents. Whereas most you know quote unquote normal people you know have this other set of ideas that is like more normal, right? Um, that is kind of like a, a pretty widespread assumption uh, in in like radical activist circles, I would say. Um, but the really radical thing to realize is that especially nowadays, there is no, there is no center. Like there is no common, there is no common set of mainstream normal ideas that most people have anymore. There's this like incredible fracturing and diversity of, uh, like ideological niches. Um, and I, I think that like, would you disagree? No, I do agree, but I'm trying to think about it in a, in a certain way. So I was just thinking about personality and how most people are actually not very open to experience. So I'll just kind of go through personality sure. really quick for listeners who are not very familiar with it. There's an acronym that you can use called OCEAN, which is for the big five personality characteristic. So there's openness, openness to experience, which is how 
ready you are to accept new ideas and how open you are to things like art and literature and, and weird things like that. There's um, C, which is conscientiousness, which is kind of how responsible you are, how much you meet deadlines, um, how punctual you are, things like that. There's um, E, which is extroversion. Everybody knows extroversion, introversion. There's A, which is agreeableness, which is how likely you are to go along to get along. And then there's N, which is neuroticism, which is kind of your emotional ability, lability, uh, and uh, anxiety. And I just... I do wonder how people who are sort of middle of the road on these kind of different characteristics, how they ended up being pushed into various niches. And mm. I think it's because there has been, you know, when the fracturing started happening, there started to be words that were used by, by certain people. And you started rejecting anyone who didn't believe in the same definitions of these words or these, you know, there's a, there's a lexicon for all these different groups. And I found that when I, I have a very, very hardcore feminist activist friend in London. And when she and I talked about these things initially, we thought we disagreed a lot. But then when we kind of broke down definitions and things, we realized right. that we agreed a lot. So right. while you think the fracturing might be good, I think that the fracturing, it actually doesn't necessarily represent, uh, plethora of ideas being developed right it might just represent a plethora of lexicons and rules for admission i totally agree it's like sociological boundaries not intellectual really yes but it's like it's actually social sociological walls um but it's it's masked as it presents itself as intellectual differences so maybe this fractionalization, so I was thinking about, uh, I was reading about this guy named Razib Khan, who is on Twitter, and he is, you know, written for libertarian circles, and he's also written about, and you were interested in human behavior, uh, biodiversity. Um, now there's more and more evidence coming out about certain things that people find unpleasant, which is things like their, you know, genetic differences, how genetics might influence uh, IQ, how there might be actually physiological differences between racial groups that are actually biologically important and things like that. And so, I mean, one aspect of this fractionalization that I'm just thinking of off the top of my head might be actually the fractional, you know, the, the fracturing that happens when evidence creeps in that challenges your worldview mm -hmm. and how you have to staunch the flow of that evidence. Yeah. And so if you're accepting evidence from certain domains, you know, like leftists very, very keen on accepting the preponderance of evidence about, uh, anthropogenic climate change, for example. Mm. Um, but, and this is something that Daniel Hannon, who's quite a hardcore conservative tweeted the other day, uh, but they are also not willing to accept the science on GMO, not willing to accept the science on whatever the safety of fracking. So there's are certain areas where they're willing to accept the science and they're where they're unwilling to accept the science. And I think if they let other people in with more nuanced views, there's this thing called Mm. epistemic hygiene, mm -hmm. right? And epistemic hygiene, you know, to, to, a, to a really hardcore leftist or to a conservative, I actually think I could get a lot more followers if I wasn't like, I'm vegan too. And if I didn't tweet about animal rights, right. because I think a lot of people get on board with me like, oh, this woman is challenging social justice and feminism. And then I'll be like, animals are really important. They're like, no, fuck you. And so I'm like, you know, as to a leftist or a conservative, I, you know, might look like a, an attractive proposition until you get close up and you see, I don't have a turd on my face. <laughs> like there's, a, there's just this, this kind of disgust at people who, because the, 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 the stem of information is, or the stream of information is so fast. Right. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. I think that what we're, what we're seeing now and what we're going to keep seeing more of in the immediate future is people realizing that there's more to gain from going from exiting that epistemic hygiene and just taking your risks on whatever the diversity of things you actually think are, yeah. so, you know what I mean? And I think that's kind of what I was trying to describe before with like this, this, this fracturing, um, you know, it's like you can have a certain worldview and be afraid of it being punctured from, you know, a threatening counter evidence, or you can just totally kick back, open yourself up to all of that counter evidence and shoot down all the different alleys that that counter evidence suggests you should shoot down. And it, and it, it, I think it's like, it's very cognitively sort of, uh, stressful, I think. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons, right? Because we know that people like seek cognitive sort of consistency. Um, it's like a kind of stress to, 
to have contradictory ideas or viewpoints that you can't actually kind of make perfectly coherent on any given day. People especially want to signal that they're consistent because if you're an inconsistent person, then you're not a good social actor. You're not a good social partner. If I can't predict what you're going to do at all because Mm. you're very inconsistent from one day to the next or because you change your mind a lot, then I'm going to have a much more mistrust in you and I'm not going to be able to be as close to you. So if you want to be a good social partner with someone, you have to really not just signal that you have the same beliefs as them, but you have to signal consistency. It's so surprising to me, you know, in the effective altruist communities and in rationalist communities and among utilitarians, updating was what we call it. People find that kind of a computer analogy, but it's true. You can, there's changing your mind, which is one kind of updating. And then there's incrementally thinking that someone else's perspective is less ridiculous than you did before, mm. or thinking that someone else's perspective is more likely than you did before. Right. And that's, there's, there's a whole spectrum of, 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 of updating. It's an interesting thing, though, that, like, why are we, especially in wealthy, like, liberal democracies, like, why are we so afraid of each other? You know, like, we don't, like, vi- like we don't kill each other anymore for the, for the most part, you know, like, obviously that's not totally true, mm. but, you know, we've never lived in more, like, we, on some level, right? This is debatable in different dimensions, right? But on some obvi- in some obvious way, we've never been, like, safer, right? Like, if you have an, ar- if you have an argument with someone on the street, the chances that person is going to kill you because of a disagreement, has never been lower in human history, probably. Um, and so it's like, we actually live in, like, very boring, sterile, pacified societies. Like, what, like, why are we so afraid? Like, why are we so afraid of each other? Like, why do we need to know what the other person thinks? And why do we need that consistency? Like, there's not really a threat. Like, you could say anything. You could say, like, the most, right now, you could say, like, the most racist thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and t- I could be totally surprised. Oh my God. I thought Diana, I thought this Diana person was like, you know, maybe a little right wing maybe, but uh, I thought she was like pretty, nor- pretty reasonable, yeah. pretty smart. Nothing like too bad. Um, and you could totally stun me. Right. And, and I'd be terrified by the, the horror of what you just said, but I wouldn't, I would find like, I wouldn't feel threatened, you know, like I would, I would maybe be surprised and shocked, but it, it wouldn't like make me sad or scared or, it would maybe make me confused or surprised and I'd want to like understand it better. But why, what is it that makes people so like actually frightened to the point that like deep psychological mechanisms kick in um, and this like signaling defensive stuff kind of kicks in so rapidly when we know that like, you know, no matter how racist this person across the table from me might be, or no matter how evil one of their thoughts might be, everything is fine. But we don't really, no one's going to do anything to me. We don't really know that. So I think we, you know, we lived throughout prehistory and here I'm going to talk like an evolutionary psychologist, but we, you know, we lived throughout history. There was the possibility that people could kill us. Uh, and there was the possibility of, of warfare and famine. And it is very important to cultivate very strong social bonds so that we can be protected, you know, if we have illness or injury. And so I think our fundamental attitude about the risk Uh, of the environment has actually not changed, but the social media environment and the social environment makes us feel really competitive for close relationships with other people. Hmm. And so if you don't signal that you're consistent and if you don't signal, for example, like if you have me on the, you're having me on the podcast, right? Some of your previous, you know, radicalized friends would say, Oh, Diana tweeted something that discrimination is actually not the, foundation of all differences and outcomes between groups. Mm. And that is, that is basically racism. And then I can't believe that you even talk to her. You know, you see this with people like, uh, you know, Dave Rubin and Bill Maher, uh, you know, Bill Maher just had, you know, Milo on a show. He kissed his ass a little bit, but people have said like, I'm going to totally reject you because of your association with this other person. Right. And so that's what I don't get. Well, there has to be a lot of signaling because the, the threshold for rejection in a very, very crowded social marketplace is very low. So there's a low threshold for rejection in a crowded social marketplace. And so we still feel the same pressure to have so close social bonds because those were actually, you know, what our survival and reproduction was contingent on. But we haven't updated on that. What we have updated on is the degree of competition there is for those, you know, those close social relationships with kind of movers and shakers. And in addition to that, if you have a lot of good personality, like if you're successful and you're smart and you have a lot going on, you know, if people are friends with you because of your intellectual capacity, then you don't have to worry that much necessarily about signaling how much you adhere to the core values of the in-group. Mm. You have to worry about adhering very close to the core values of the in-group. Let's say if you have a family, you don't have time to do other intellectual stuff that other people might admire. Or if you just don't have a lot to offer other than 
you're signaling how committed you are to the core values of the in-group. I see what you mean. Right. So you think the ma- the big variable that's increased sort of the intensity of this, like, signaling culture is is competition for... Competition for attention. And competition for attention translates into the impression that you're competing. And li- mm. I've just literally made up this idea in the last ten minutes. No, that's super good. <laughs> that's super interesting hypothesis. The thing that still perplexes me, though, is... Do you know what is one of the best strategies for getting attention? Having a fucking correct idea yeah. or being being smart, being true, no, right? Like, no. uh, well, <laughs> but no, but I think I think I think that this is changing, and this is what I want to hypothesize. Like, like these dynamics, which I think you you very intelligently hypothesize about, that have been causing sort of this like signaling culture to become more and more intense. Perhaps it is competition for attention. Perhaps it's other things also. I think we've sort of, like, reached, we've, like, crossed the threshold at which it's become sort of increasingly obvious how stupid and over-the-top and kind of useless it all is. So I think that what we're now seeing, maybe, is this sort of, like, defection from that way of communicating. Mm. Because, well, it, it doesn't even get you attention anymore, right? Like, if, if the point of that signaling culture is, like, you know, relation, you know, comp- competing for attention or whatever it might be, it's like an oversaturated market. And so it's like you're not even that interesting or attractive or people don't care that much because it's all it's basically all noise at this point. It's becoming clear that a lot of it is noise. So I think that's why, like, I mean, one way you can understand a relationship such as the one you and I have now or, or like, these, like, weird, interesting, in, like, internet niches um, is, like, isn't that, isn't that kind of like a defection of, of people who are starting to realize, like, actually, it, it's actually way better for me to invest in trying to think what I actually think and just put to other people and put on paper or put on the internet or whatever in however iterative and like sort of weak or slow or difficult a fashion to actually just uh, say what I think with whoever in whatever weird little community might find it interesting or worthwhile. I I feel like that is increasing right now. In my mind, there's a very small minority of people who have the attentional luxury to do what we're Mm. doing. Mm. You know, who have the time and energy to think about things as long and hard as we do, who are as high on openness as we are. Like, you and I have radically changed our minds about various things. I went vegan in one day. I read Animal Liberation, I went vegan the next day. And that was, I think, the, for me, the kind of stepping stone to being somebody who could radically, radically change my mind. And then just G, just IQ, just the ability to kind of weigh nuance and to think about things in a deep way. And... In addition to that, I think I'm not very agreeable, and I don't think you're very agreeable either. Um, so we, you know, we are happy to debate, and we're happy to tell people um, that they're wrong. But I think that there's some also problem with that. I think you have to be a bit disagreeable to update and actually to go against the mm. the the core of your group. And, it, and you know, if I think about things like this, you know, if I was somebody who had kids or somebody with chronic illness. I don't know if anybody's shown this before. My my impression about people who have a vulnerable position, let's say people who are below the poverty line or whatever, is for me to shake the, you know, to rock the boat, to lose all my friends, which has happened to me before. I moved over here. I became more right wing. I lost, I I stopped being friends with like about half my friends when I became vegan. And like that, I don't give a shit. Like, that's fine. I make new friends. I'm extroverted as well. And you're also really super extroverted. I mean, you like to be alone, but you can socialize better than most people. So we don't actually have a lot to lose. And a lot of people really do have a lot to lose. So you think this, this fracturing is good. I think it is, to some extent, interesting to be able to pick and choose from these various groups and have this proliferation of, of memes. But I don't think many people are foraging around like we are. Right. They're not. They're still not. But I think it's increasing. Mm-hmm. I think. I, and my evidence is partially introspective that I'm kind of a case study of what I'm talking about because I, for the past several years, I haven't been doing this sort of thing. I've been kind of in like the left bubble yeah. and the whole like. Uh, a insane kind of like closed minded signaling uh, kind of form of communication. I've been very much like I've been habited that for the past like several years in some sense. Um, so anyway, I don't know. I mean, I think that like people are, and I, and I see it in my, uh, some of my like radical friends, like most of the, there is this sort of like fracturing even I th- within the left. Like people are starting to sort of realize like the mass assumptions and kind of like, like you said, kind of, uh, requirements to even be accepted into the club have become kind yeah. of like, uh, 
more counterproductive and even conservative ultimately than 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 useful. I had something I wanted to move on to yeah, sure, about sure. this, which was that. Uh, so I met this guy, uh, this very dear friend of mine in London, is dating a guy who was very much a part of the Egyptian Revolution and was very involved in Tudor Square, and that was possibly you know an offshoot of of Occupy. And he and I had this you know quite heated debate about IQ. He thinks it's not important at all, and he thinks that people who have been, you know, discriminated against throughout history, that they, uh, there's this idea uh, in the left, for example, that there's this kind of generational trauma that gets passed on. And then, of course, I said, you know, if if this trauma gets passed on, then why are Ashkenazi Jews, who were killed by the millions, the most successful mm. minority, hmm. you know, in America? And he said, well... <laughs> just because they make a lot of money and are wildly successful doesn't mean they're happy. I'm like, oh, come on. There are measures of success and then there are measures of success, right? But one thing that really struck me is this rejection of any kind of idea about hierarchy, this rejection of IQ, this rejection that any kind of way of contributing is any worse than any other way of contributing, this radical inclusion that I think unites the left. Do people in Occupy or do people in anarchist circles ever really talk about how radical inclusion can make a group much weaker than a group would be if it was more elitist? Yeah, there's definitely an awareness of that, I think. Um, but I think the ten- I think it's fair to say the tendency is uh, just don't focus on that. <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, it's often like, and I think I think this is true on the right and the left. It's like it. All ideologies are, are essentially pathologies, I think, basically. Is that, do you think that's fair to say? Like, they're, <laughs> like, well, in the sense that, like, they're simplifying mechanisms or si- simplifying devices that we know produce a lot of error for, like, a certain amount of, like, the gain, the gain is simplicity, right, or parsimony, but we know that, that right, it's like a, it's like a simplification I think device. I if you, depending on how rational your group in is, I think an ideology usually involves a group of ideas that actually cluster together rationally. Maybe not usually, but in the case of the ideologies that I'm keen on, they sure. are things that rationally kind of fit together. Uh, so a lot of people have ideologies that are conflicting. But, you know, in, right, terms, but of, in terms of radical inclusion, uh, yeah. No, no, I was just, I'm just thinking, like, um, I know it's a little bit diffuse. Like, you... Like, the, the really interesting people, I think... They, it's not that they don't have ideology, ide- ideological baggage of, of different kinds, but they're like piecing it together in like a totally independent, creative, updating way, right? Uh, which is very different than like being, you know, being like having like a left ideology, right? So like, um, for to take your like profile of of interests or whatever, like right, like veganism, effective altruism, evolutionary psychology whatever else sort of, uh, that you're interested in, Mm. like those don't necessarily have one, uh, overarching, uh, ideological dimension. That's not one ideological dimension. Would you agree? I think that all of those things are are sort of an outgrowth of my kind of utilitarianism. One thing that, uh, I've, you know, I was recently, I think Sam Harris was talking about this, which was, uh, he was saying that, you know, I shouldn't be able to predict your view on nuclear power based on your view on abortion, based on your view about right. recycling. Right. Like, actually, if you think about, you know, those three in particular, recycling, exactly. nuclear power, and abortion, there's all different kinds of ways that you could have views about those things. Right. And yet people do tend to uh, congeal around a set of attitudes about these things. And I think that goes against what you were saying. I don't think people are picking and choosing. I think people are just mimicking the attitudes of those people who they most want to associate with. Yeah, 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 I totally agree. But when, when like, the left-right divide, for instance, just has one dimension, right, or partisanship, whether it be, like, party identification or however you want to define it, um, we do know that over the past several decades, um, political partisanship has uh, come to more tightly structure those different diverse uh, attitudes and opinions. Uh, All of those diversity of opinions do load more and more recently on the, the partisan divide. That is pathological. Unless you think that that's logic, and that's like that's like a logical consistency emerging, um, I would, to me, to me that's pathological, and like the error term is going to be increasing. The error term in the sum of those attitudes yeah. is going to be increasing to the degree that they're uh, like subordinated to this one dimension that doesn't really have any particular reason for explaining all of them. 
Does yeah, that make sense? So, it, so when you're when you say pathological, I think that you mean something different than I mean. I actually think oh, probably. <laughs> yeah, I think that when you're saying pathological, you mean something like turning away from logic, mm. or turning away from reason, or turning away from rationality, sure, or turning away from truth. And what I'm saying is that you know, if I if somebody said to me uh, using drugs is pathological, I'd be like, yeah, it makes people unhappy stuff. So, but as as far as as far as if I was trying to do something that would bring me the most pleasure and my life was shit, then it's actually totally rational to do drugs. Right. I and forgot I'm talking to a psychologist. <laughs> I'm using words informally and I, I No, I totally it's totally you. fine. Yeah. I, but I totally what you're saying. So yes, it is pathological in that it does turn away from... So ideology does cause us to turn away from truth, but it's not pathological in that it actually does really promote close social bonds and the weirder your ideology is you know this is what a new idea that i have because i've been thinking a lot about how human beings shape each other how we reinforce and punish each other and actually if you can make your friends weird then you are more if you are more unique to them so this is you know cosmides and tubi had this idea that what you want to do as a social partner is advertise the ways in which you are unique, right? But another thing that you want to do as a social partner is to try and push somebody, especially somebody who's really desirable as a social partner, you want to try to make their ideology as weird as possible and as in line with yours as possible so that you have less competition for their attention. Right. And so not only are people trying to associate with other people by picking up their ideology and adhering to it, right. but also people are trying to make themselves and other people weirder so that there's less competition for right. those, especially, especially if I have like somebody who I'm really, you know, who I can see is really popular and has a lot of competition for attention. I'm going to maybe try to push them to have quite repugnant views that I also hold because right. then... Right. It legitimates then, your repugnant views. No, it doesn't just legitimate my repugnant views. It makes it such that other people wouldn't tolerate them and I will. Okay. Interesting. But it also gives... It also is going to give some social power to your... It makes... Like, it, yeah. your views, right? It gives... It may, well, it, it does, it's not about my views. So, I think this is kind of where we're... we're you're talking like a political scientist and I'm talking like a psychologist. Okay is that I'm saying that it's actually not my views that are important. Nobody's views are important. Right. <laughs> you know, in, in, in terms of, like, the base, basic... You know, so my views are important in that I have developed to be somebody who signals my, my IQ and my rationality and my intelligence and my openness and my willingness to update and all these things. And that's why rationality is important to me, because that's become the basis for my social group and my social bonds. Hmm. And you're saying rationality is important for its own sake. It is... To, y- to us, <laughs> but it's not to most people. And so I don't necessarily want my views to have more power. I might do, but only insofar as it makes my social group more immune to invaders. And, and you know, weirdly, this radical inclusivity on the left actually does have a, you know, promotes a certain kind of social interaction that is actually quite immune to um, right. what's called... Um, there's a word in game theory. Now I feel mm. like that asshole on Twitter was like, what's this time for some game theory? <laughs> <laughs> There's the evolutionary straight stable strategy, but then I don't know if the word is intruders or interlopers or anyway. Right. Do you sure. know what I'm talking about? Um, not exactly, but I, I so like, let's, say, let's say you have like a, like a, you know, a, it's good at keeping outsiders out. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. good at keeping outsiders out. It's good at, at keeping, um, other kinds of strategies in. So like if you have a, a very trust based social group and, Let's say you, you you have a you think about prisoner's dilemma or whatever, you have a group where everybody's cooperating all the time. That group is going to be very, very sensitive to you know, another strategy can come in that always defects and like totally fuck that, that trust group up. Right. right. So that group is very vulnerable to intruders. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Now you just have me thinking about what are my repugnant views I can get you to try to like kind of co-sign accidentally. What I can like manipulate you into co-signing that will legitimate my views and also like <laughs> increase my power re- with respect to you and yeah. keep you like beholden to me. That's right. Like, ideally, I, I, I try to get you to say some things that basically would so ruin your reputation in academia and in like libertarian Twitterverse yeah. so that your only friend online would become me yeah. and then you'd have to do everything you ever want to do through me. That's right. <laughs> Well, I think that's, that's another reason why people... Um, What's the most racist thing you think? Very, Please. 
are very sensitive to whether or not somebody's telling them a secret. That's why secrets feel so good to be told is not only are you somebody signaling to you that they have a special closeness to you, but you have a power of somebody when they tell you a secret that you didn't have before. Yeah, for sure. And the thing about, the thing about you that you said before about how we want to make each other weird. Yeah. I think that's really interesting. And especially when you think about it in terms of like long term like romantic relationships, like yeah. marriage or whatever it might be. Like, <laughs> like be, now I've been married for a few years now and having this experience, like there's definitely a thing where you, we like actively kind of like make each other weird, but it's fun. Also, it's cool. Like it's, it's, but it's interesting to think about it. Like it's, it's what makes like shared life charming and, and unique and, you're and your own culture. Yeah. yeah you're exactly you're, like your own world, but you're inter- but it's interesting. You make me think that it, there is something to it kind of like unconsciously, like not purposely at all. But, like, we are kind of, like, we're making the possibility of us ever being able to, like, live with someone else, like, less and less likely. You know, because, like, we have our own little world. The idea that one of us could leave it to go happily have a life with someone else, it's, like, that's a decreasing probability the weirder and weirder we get. But I think that's cool. That's, like, like I guess you could, there's, like, a sort of, like, critique of that. Like, that's horrifying and pathological. You're, like, basically uh, subconsciously abusing and twisting each other into these, like, uh, you know, uh, forms that, (laughs) forms that will be, like, never be able to function with anyone else ever. I could see the critique of that for sure. Um, but you can also see it in, like, a kind of cool way. Like, that's kind of cool, right? That, like, we have these ways to make our relationships really unique and deep and, and, like, irreplaceable. Like, I think that's, like, a pretty cool and kind of beautiful power, too. And, like, when two people choose to do that together... I think that's actually pretty beautiful. You've made like, yourselves irreplaceable. Most people just do that kind of by shared history. And we had this kind of discussion the first time we met about kind of polyamory. And I think in polyamory is sort of like a battlefield of love in that I'm trying to make myself even more irreplaceable because unlike, you know, people who are monogamous, I actually am facing, you know, the real and direct threat of competition. Mm, right. And so I believe in hierarchical polyamory and I'm not going to kind of go into all the reasons <laughs> why that actually makes a whole lot more sense than anarcho poly, which is, you know, I think you and I both agree in that thinking anarcho poly is just a recipe for disaster. But what I'm trying to do is to make my partner weird enough that he can have, you know, he he can have other sex partners, he can have other lovers, he can have other girlfriends, but no one is ever going to be able to tolerate all his views because I've made him that way. Mm. And uh, he's so always, do you think he's always saying I've perverse, you know, perverted his his like brain? Yeah, that's super uh-huh. interesting. <laughs> Actually, let's talk more about this. Cause I'm, so. I'm curious to know, like, from from your perspective as a psychologist, but also from your own personal perspective or whatever, do you think that, like, intense uh, unilateral or, you know, intense bilateral monogamous love, like, are you of the opinion that that's kind of like a a, a sick and twisted, ultimately kind of unhealthy no, thing? Or, no, not at all. Because, you, you know, I'm sure you know this sort of critique, right, that it's like, it's kind of basically like two people kind of deluding themselves into controlling each other because they're basically afraid of, you know, it's, it's basically a, like a kind of threat yeah. reduction thing that basically closes both people off to like a whole wide world that they could be a free or healthier, you know, person in. Um, you're not of that view though. So, I was, I was kind of hoping you would be so I could like, <laughs> it, you about it, cause I'm like so down with monogamy. And um, I'm so into it. Yeah. You're so into monogamy. I, I've been monogamous before. I just think there's a variety of reasons why I think polyamory is, you know, better for me, but I don't think it's necessarily better for everybody. I think most people actually find it too stressful and I'm not somebody who thinks, so I do think actually monogamy with occasional cheating, which inevitably happens, I actually think is kind of the default model. Um, In terms of frequency, like it's most common. Yeah, in terms of frequency. And I also think that that's like, that's pretty healthy. Like a certain degree of deception I think is healthy and a certain degree of, yeah, a certain degree of like stepping out is, is fine. Um, it, it generally happens after a, after a period of time, you know, so people do talk about kind of itches and about, mm. uh, Helen Fisher as, and other people have famously said, you know, after three years together, that's the amount of time it takes to, uh, to have and wean a child or four years is the amount of time it takes to have and wean a child. And so actually after that point, you might want to go put your eggs into a new genetic basket. Mm. And there's a lot of mismatches, you know, in terms of the current environment and the ancestral environment. And I think polyamory there's a, there's a variety of reasons I like it. One reason I like it is because I like being exposed to new ideas and you develop a closeness with somebody that you're intimate with sexually that you don't with like normal 
everyday friends. Although, I mean, most of the people that I sleep with, I just kind of call friends. I don't really call them my, my boyfriends or girlfriends. So I think that that's one thing that's really good about that is that yeah, I get exposed to a lot of new ideas. Another one is that kind of healthy competition. So if you think that you're irreplaceable to your primary partner, but there's a certain degree of competition, you admire them and take them less for granted. You make more effort than you would otherwise. Mm. If you're locked in, Mm. There's not always a lot of effort. And, you know, Dan Savage and other people have said it's actually good to get out with your partner and see them being admired by other people, sure. for example, yeah, yeah. because it reminds you that you have uh, a, sure. you know, a special a special bond with somebody who other people find desirable. And polyamory, you know, I know like a lot of people who are sort of libertarian or who are free thinkers who have an ideological promotion of poly, which is something that you probably come across with, which nobody's your property, you have sovereignty, and I'm a utilitarian, so I don't really think about things like this. I don't think that rules have to be symmetrical. My rules with my partner are not symmetrical, so there's things that bother him a whole lot more than they bother me. There's a lot of things he can do that I don't give a shit about that I can't do um, without without a lot of conversation, and so I, that doesn't bother me at all. It's not about sovereignty. It's about maximizing the amount of enjoyment I can mm. get from life and my relationships. Mm. That's interesting. See, this is where, like, my Catholic anarchism streak kind of comes in, because on the one hand... What is like, Catholic anarchism? Can you just well, that first? I really, to be honest, I, <laughs> to be totally honest, I really don't know what it is. All I know is it's like a label that kind of uh, names two things I'm kind of... That, that tend to kind of ad- adequately describe certain dimensions of what I think, and, and yeah, whatever. But, um... To me, like, what it means in this context, and the reason I'm I'm kind of interested in this tradition, is, like, I think people should do whatever the fuck they want, and I think people should be free to do whatever they want. Um, That's the anarchist part. But I also think that uh, pleasure is very bad and dangerous and sinful, and it should be, like, avoided at all cost. I mean, I really, I basically do honestly think that. Uh, and so, like, I love monogamy for, let me tell you some of the reasons I love monogamy. Well, first of all, I love my wife, like, and I, I love, not only do I love my wife, but I love loving one person. Like, I love doting. I love, like, having one person who is, like, orders of magnitude more important than anyone else in the world. Like, that's just, it's beautiful, it's fun, it's, like, special and weird and so unique and cool. And, like, I, I, I find that, like, loving, you know, being loved, uh, and, and loving itself are, like, both as, like, useful and, 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 you know, supportive and empowering, I think. Uh, you gain a lot from, like, I think loving only one person in, in this really intense way. Of course, you can love lots of people in different ways. Um, but I've just found that, like, I really like it is one, you know, small reason. Um, but I think that basically, like, there have been so many, ever since I sort of, like, made this, like, serious, long-term kind of monogamous commitment, so many other good things have been, like, kicked into effect that I didn't even know would happen. Um, and I've been so surprised and kind of, like, pleased by that that I, I feel, like, almost, like, slightly missionary in my kind of, like, uh, will to express and share, like, the, the virtues and the, the magic of, like, monogamy because I honestly didn't even realize it. So, so like, one really cool thing is, like, my ability to interact with, like, attractive women <laughs> has, like, increased so, so much. It's, like, so much healthier and better and smarter. Because, like, you know, when you're not monogamous, anytime you see, like, an attractive person of the sex that you desire, it's, like, a distraction, basically. It's, like, how can I get this person to sleep with me? How am I, I going to play it? Can I, can I get this? Yeah. Is this going to happen? Uh, you know, and it's, like, that takes up so much cognitive processing. Mental real estate, yeah. And also, but, but yeah, not only is it sort of, like, it, it, it absorbs your neural resources... But it fucks up your even even your basic capacities to like be honest. I think. I mean, may, maybe maybe like uh, not for everyone, but I think that like so long as like you kind of want to have sex with someone, you're never going to be able to say to that person or be to that person like in a particular moment exactly as you really are. Um, Other than your wife, you you can be as you are with your wife yeah. because you guys are locked into a sexual relationship. But if you want to have sex with someone else, you can't be totally honest with them. Yeah, I think. I think. Well, the thing is that it's so hard and I think it's so hard to have like a really genuine, honest, transparent kind of uh, like interpersonal presence. Hmm. Like in our world today. I mean, like that's just a hard thing to do. Um, Almost all of our social interactions, especially with like strangers or new friends or whatever, are going to be so marked by all the different kinds of like signaling and instrumental psychological tactics that we do on each other that you know much about, that you've you've talked to me about. Um, 
So, like, what I'm interested in with other people at all times, like, interacting with other people, is I'm interested in, like, how deep can we relinquish and renounce and push away those, like, bullshit kind of, like, uh, vaguely exploitative, vaguely competitive, vaguely kind of instrumentally controlling uh, tendencies that we all have, right? So, like, I'm interested in trying to figure out how deep we can access a space of, like, just radical honesty, radical transparency, and radical just, like, uh, no ulterior motives, right? Like, that's that's something that I'm very interested in, is, like, cultivating spaces and relationships where ulterior motives are are, are sincerely and, and seriously, like, um, released. Um, I think you're just replacing some ulterior motives with other ulterior motives. So, yeah, perhaps... You, you think you can't get around having ulterior motives? I don't think you can get around having ulterior motives. And I also think that, for me, adding a sexual possibility into many different kinds of relationships, friendships and dating relationships actually makes things kind of more interesting, more complex. And I can get closer to somebody, um, if I have a sexual relationship in addition to a friendship with them, or, you know, I have a lot of like, especially with women, sort of these quasi romantic relationships where like occasionally we have sex, but usually we're just friends. And I do think that that adds another dimension Mm -hmm. and that actually adds a degree of honesty because in the, I actually wrote about this. Yeah. I wrote a paper about orgasm, which is about uh, orgasm is reinforcement, orgasm is behaviorism. In that, if you have a sexual, if you have sexual contact with somebody, they learn to associate you with pleasure, and then you become, you know, much more bonded to them, and mm-hmm. also they just start to associate with you with good things. So yes, if your only source of sexual pleasure is your primary, is your you know monogamous partner, then that person is completely singular in that respect. I think that in, in hierarchical poly, you know, or even in regular, even regular old, whatever, multiple poly, um, somebody can, you know, so my boyfriend is still totally singular to me in many ways because we're both really, really weird in specific ways. And because we have a kind of connection that's quite unusual. Uh, so I don't, I think, you know, one thing that I think is quite interesting about monogamy versus polyamory, and this might be um, moving things around slightly, is that uh, I think that if you are in a relationship with someone, in a monogamous relationship with somebody, and you love each other because you are attracted to each other and you're nice to each other, then there are a million threats in the environment in terms of other people who could take that place, who you're infinitely replaceable if all you have going for each other is that you're nice and you're attracted to each other. Mm. Whereas if you're weird in a plethora of different ways, then it's actually easier to be poly because there is very few other people who are going to be fit in that that niche, right? Right. And what happens with many people, and I think even, even really, really normal people, they can have so much history with somebody that they've become irreplaceable, where they develop that kind of culture that you were talking about together. Mm. such that even if they're not weird people with weird views, they've weirdified each other and they've become so unusual and irreplaceable to each other that people who open up later, like a decade in, they have very little to worry about oftentimes other than whatever new relationship energy. Kind right, because of they have this base of like really unique weirdness that no one's really going to be able well, to compete with. They've cultivated, yeah. But if you if you just, if you get together with somebody in the initial stages and all you have going for each other is that you're nice to each other and you're attracted to each other, then yeah, anybody can come in and take that. Hmm. Anybody. And that's why I think it's, it's, uh, that's why I think it can be so volatile and heartbreaking hmm. and horrible. Right. But I do know a woman who's gone from being poly to monogamous because she thinks, and she's, I think, quite utilitarian as well. She thinks that the romance and the devotion and even the sense of longing when you're apart and the sense, all of that kind of stuff is so delicious and pleasurable to her that she's willing to give up all of the other kinds of interesting sex that she could be having Mm. or the the kinds of uh, other kinds of relationships she could be having. She likes that extra component, even the pain of Mm. longing with her, with her romantic partner so much Mm. that um, she's made a utilitarian calculation to be monogamous. And that is something that I can respect. (laughs) Oh, interesting. Okay. The pain of not being able to have, yeah, so like, the, other pleasures. Yeah, so, like, yeah. you know, if somebody goes away, and then you're like, okay, well, you know, you're going away for the weekend, so you have a date, and I'll have a date. We'll hardly miss each other, right? She wants them both to feel that longing, and then both yes, to feel that I sense like that. of satisfaction when they get back together. Yeah. Um, whereas, uh, you know, in my utilitarian view, and there's kind of different flavors of utilitarianism, if I could... You know, obviously showing someone you miss them is a signal of your degree of commitment. And if somebody never misses you, I actually know some really hardcore utilitarians who said, I've trained myself not to miss anybody. 
but it's also very difficult for someone to feel like they're irreplaceable unless you show them that you that you miss them a lot. Mm. And I would really prefer that nobody missed me to the point where they were depressed or lonely or anxious. Mm. But then again, there's part of me that knows that that's... I know that I'm secure when I see that. That's a signal to me, right? right? And so from kind of a utilitarian perspective, I think that Polly, like if my partner sees someone else while we're apart and we often are cause we're long distance, I really like the fact that he's suffering less mm. than he would otherwise. I think I just like suffering and I think pleasure is evil. And bad. I think you like suffering. Well, I think pleasure, yeah. but I also I think like, I, I think I'm just not into pleasure. Like I think the pleasure, especially like physical pleasure is bad. Like in the sense that like, I believe in sublimation. <laughs> you know, I think, like, I think I, I think people should, like, work hard on big projects that require, like, delaying gratification and delaying pleasure maybe forever. Like, I, I'm, like, of course, like, anyone, you know, I have sexual desires or whatever, but I like not, not satisfying them. Do you know what I mean? Like, that makes me feel powerful and it makes me feel, and I put that energy into other projects. And there is, and maybe that, like, I wouldn't call it suffering, but it, there's a certain kind of, like, struggle or like gravitas to it that you only do really get from like denying yourself like certain pleasures. And I think that's healthy to do. And I like to do that. Uh, So you think that cultivating delayed gratification is making you a a better person. And I mean, I wouldn't call that pleasure because I think that's probably too trite a word and it is very difficult to kind of weigh these things out. Right. And I do believe in obviously having distal rewards. I'm an academic. All my rewards are distal practically. Right. Um, but I think that, you know, I have, I find, I find that balanced out, I think by my, uh, by my personal life, um, delaying my, you know, if, if I had years and years where I was involved with somebody, uh, monogamously and I didn't know what kinds of other opportunities they were, were available because of that, um, I wouldn't feel like I had developed as a person because of that. I would just feel like Mm. I had missed out. (laughs) And, and I think that you and I kind of differ in that respect in, in that, I am probably thinking more about proximate rewards more often than you are. Um, yeah. So one thing going back to social media, I find that if I'm trying to work on something really hard, what I always want to do is tweet something really controversial on Twitter. So I have to babysit it, which is really stupid. (laughs) Right. You need like something else going on that can give immediate stimulus, right? Yeah. So, so what I've done is, you know, in behaviorism, uh, if there's a punishment, what happens is the pu- there's a punishment, but there's also a negative reinforcement such that the escape behavior is reinforced. And so for me, the escape behavior of posting a controversial tweet is reinforced because then I don't have to work on the hard thing that I'm working on. Right. But then do you get back to working on the hard thing? Sometimes, sometimes not. Sometimes I just like, so I tweeted something controversial. Like I tweeted this thing about, um, kink and sociopathy the other day that caught me in trouble a little bit. And, um, And I just, well, I also like it when people talk smack about me. I just like attention. (laughs) I mean, the reason I ask is because there is definitely a thing I've done before that you can do. For me, it's like pretty rare. And the risks of going down like a total distraction rabbit hole Mm -hmm. are too high to make the strategy like good for me uh, in in a repeated constant way. But I have definitely had some days where you can use sort of bullshit social media interactions to give you a little bit of dopamine, which you then can convert into yeah. like g- uh, an extra hour of like more disciplined, more focused work than you would have been able to do without that dopamine hit. So I definitely had some days where I've been able to do this kind of like positive feedback thing where like I'll do two hours of really focused work and that will make me proud and satisfied of myself. And that'll inspire me to like maybe take a little bit more of a risk online than I normally would. And then like the stimulus that comes from that makes me go back into my work even harder. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you can definitely get on that kind of thing, which is, that's really good if you can do it, but the risks of getting of, of all of a sudden having three hours gone you, because you're like arguing with some idiot on Twitter, like that, that, those risks, I think are a little bit too high. But. There's a guy, a uh, effective altruist guy, who said that he was playing a video game for like five hours, then he took a nap, and then he said he felt that state of flow was transferred. I almost never find a state of flow gets transferred, and it is amazing to me when I'm having a debate with somebody, like for instance on Facebook rather than on Twitter, because Twitter it's just not very easy to have such debates because there's such little space. And obviously if you send like 10 tweets to somebody, you start to feel like an asshole in the way that writing a novel length response on Facebook doesn't make you feel like an asshole, which is why Twitter's better. Um, but I generally find that I'm much more fluent when I'm arguing with somebody 
than I, than when I'm not. And I have sometimes taken comments that I've written on Facebook and pasted them into a new document in case I ever want to write a blog because that stuff is all great fodder. Right, right. Uh, I've, done too. I've done that too. I've done that too. When I'm arguing I have done with that. people, yeah, yeah. When I'm arguing with somebody about something interesting, which is usually, I think I'm usually arguing with somebody about something interesting on on Facebook or Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, I try to n- write. N- I try to put nothing original on Facebook itself. Every time, like. When I ha- sometimes I'll accidentally catch myself writing a long Facebook response or reply to someone on someone's like bullshit thread. Yeah. And I will, I'll take a deep breath. I'll <laughs> copy it. I'll paste it into my like writing documents, yeah. my notes, and then I'll delete it from Facebook and I'll close Facebook. Um, and then I'll, and then I, like I have in fact in the past like that will become a blog post or something like that. That's a great. Uh, I just hate the idea of giving Facebook like original like putting my original words into their like little interface. I try to do it as little as possible. I'll put links and shit on Facebook. Yeah. But. Um, I don't know. It's just a weird, weird personal thing. So what else? Um, we had like a few other things we wanted to talk about, didn't we? Should we just like switch gears? Oh uh, yeah. I don't know s- how much, how much time have we got? Um, you got to go around five. We have, it's four forty, So we've got okay, cool. at least another 20 minutes. That's good. Yeah. So let me ask you, uh, what is human biodiversity okay. and is it real or is it a euphemism for like secret, nasty, fascist racism? Cause I think like I've seen it around and there's some people that I kind of see writing about it. And I see, like, the hashtags and stuff or whatever. Um, Also, like, we could also go into, like, stuff about, like, dysgenic trends and stuff like this. Like, I don't know much about this sort of stuff. (laughs) So I'm asking quite honestly, like, what is the, is there legit science here? Is this, like, racist bullshit? And where do you draw the lines? And what, what, yeah, what what is what? Because my my sense is, like, a lot of people on the left, I think, see these sort of, like, little uh, labels as kind of, like, no-go zones. Like, that's, like... That's like anti-scientific, racist, BS, right-winger, crazy people online. But then I see like you interacting with some people who are kind of into HBD stuff, and yeah. and some of those people seem like pretty intelligent. Um, and I just I haven't read anything about it, so maybe you could set me straight. What is that all about? Sure. And um, so HBD is human biodiversity, and it is a little bit euphemistic because it is you know, the idea that I think is biologically sound, that groups of humans have been isolated enough over time that they've developed at least different physiological characteristics. And I think what is more controversial is the idea that different groups have developed different psychological characteristics. But if you believe that different groups have different biological characteristics, which is really unrefutable, then you can believe in different psychological characteristics. And something that people tend to do in order to say that actually even biological characteristics don't differ is to say that race is entirely a social construct and that, for instance, lactose tolerance developed independently in a few different groups or darker skin developed in a few different groups or an epicanthal fold, um, you know, was maintained in Native Americans and also in East Asia. And, you know, people have different ideas about what they think is the reason for that. And so some people, like people like Jared Diamond, say that, you know, race is, yes, there are physiological differences, but there is no difference, you know, kind of from the neck up in in terms of minds. And there's a really great piece in Quillette, which I, I really recommend people read. Quillette, which is saying, you know, you can say that there are racial differences without being a racist. And there's this new word, which is sort of called racialist, which is somebody who believes in racial differences. And I think this epistemic hygiene idea is really interesting because people are really, really unwilling to even step into that pool. And mm. it's just, it, it is it is really fraught in terms of, so I was at a party when I was in graduate school and I was talking to two sociologists, I think, which was my first mistake. And they were, we were talking about various different things. And there was this famous evolutionary psychologist, sort of evolutionary psychologist named Philip Rushton, who wrote a lot about race differences and he died a few years ago. And this guy was really lambasting me with this claim. He said, well, Phil Rushton said, the bigger your penis, the smaller your brain. And that is not at all what Phil Rushton said. (laughs) I'm just going to put that straight. There's a very, very nuanced whole kind of, you know, description about, uh, the, the, the energy you put into mating effort versus the ma- uh, energy that you put into offspring effort, which is something called R and K selection. But we kind of dug down, and then I said, "Well, surely, you know, the fact that almost 
all, and I think it might be all, but I have to look it up, um, Olympic long distance runners who have won gold have been from a very small part of Kenya. I mean, the chance of that happening by chance hmm. is very, very small. And there are certain, uh, there's certain evidence that, uh, for example, Africans from certain areas, I don't know if it's, if it's, you can't really say, I mean, Africa, obviously we all evolved out of Africa and actually Africans as a group have the most genetic diversity of any other group because they have been, they were the original group. And so, and they've also, um, occupy many different kind of environmental, uh, niches. And so I said, surely you must agree with me that there's these fast twitch muscles and slow twitch muscles, which is this idea that some muscles can recover more quickly and they make uh, people better or worse at being athletic. And this guy essentially thought that the whole reason that certain racial groups excel in certain kinds of sporting events was because of the social expectations on that particular thing. So seems plausible. Uh, it doesn't seem plausible no. on me. No. no, I mean... I mean, if you're born into a world with... And different groups have different attitudes towards, like... I mean, like, social expectation does affect what we believe ourselves, conf- like, able to do, right? Like, if everyone that you see in society treats you as if you're someone who is capable of doing X, you're going to be more likely to be able to do X, probably, right? That's not So, if you look at something like, like twin studies, if you look at... Uh, twins who are separated at birth or if you look at something like adoption studies Mm. where you see a mother gives up her child for adoption um, the correlation between a mother who gives up her child for adoption and that child's personality is 0.55 the correlation between the parents uh, who adopted the child and the child is 0.05 children who are adopted from different biological mothers who end up in the same adoptive family are no more similar in personality than two strangers off the street and so if you're talking about right, things like right. expectation, um, it's just, it doesn't really it's a make, drop in the bucket. I mean, yeah, I don't really think expectation has nearly as much, as much of a predictive ability, you know, on what, what is actually somebody going to be doing with their brains and with their bodies and with their lives as actually raw aptitude. You know, if you were living in a, which is more genetic Ashkenazi Jewish community, I mean, you could, you could be really into basketball all day long, but you know, you're not going to, you have to have some raw physiological ability. And in the same way, if you look at Ashkenazi Jews who are like the, you know, very, very, um, particular racial group, like if you do 23 and me, a lot of the areas of the world where they tell you you might be from are pretty nebulous. They're like, okay, well, you're from somewhere in Northern Europe. Ashkenazi Jews have really unusual genetic markers. And even in the very conservative um, breakdown of where your you know, ethnic makeup comes from, it's very, very specific. Like my Ashkenazi Jewish makeup is very, very specific. And Ashkenazi Jews have a couple of um, neural diseases that are unusual, that are not seen in any other racial groups. And they also win the most Nobel Prizes. Right. Um, they excel at math and science and, okay. and music. And so I think that you, you, you know, to the idea that Ashkenazi Jews have this culture, you know, if, if it was the case that you could actually make a culture that made Nobel prize winners, then anybody could come in and emulate that. Okay. So the basic idea that you're saying, so human biodiversity has this like label for, um, a, a research interest is basically yeah. just the idea that different ethnic groups can have due to different genetic backgrounds, uh, differences in aptitude. Yeah. So even if you, if you see, you know, an animal, so, you know, some groups of people have been separated for as long as 40,000 years. And if you think that, you know, if you look at Darwin's finches, for example, and they have different kinds of, of beak shapes that happened on the order of a few thousand years, the idea that you know, different ethnic groups of people because of admixture, because they were never completely reproductively isolated, that they wouldn't have developed different possible aptitudes, you know, to be adapted to their particular environments. Unfortunately, those just flies in the face of, of biology. Right. But that's not necessarily, this is not an, okay. So I, I, thank you for clarifying that. Um, now that on the face of it is, there's nothing racist about that per se, right? It was just saying, you could say that, yeah. So th- I think what most people would, I, so some people say that is racist. A lot of people just saying say that. that there are just genetic differences there are, among ethnic just groups. Just saying that race is anything over and above a social construct. Many people would say that is racist. The guy who I talked to, I said, don't you think that, that, uh, there is some evidence that, um, 
Africans from whatever Kenya have more fast twitch muscles than white people, especially like somebody like Ash- Ashkenazi Jews are not known for their whatever, <laughs> their sporting prowess. Um, and he said, what do you mean racist science? And I was like, well, if you think science is racist, if you think the science that shows that these physiological differences exist, we actually have nothing to talk about. Mm. Because if you think that that the, the science of these differences is just perpetuating racist stereotypes, then you could also say that whole body of science, all of the stuff about genetic differences between groups of people is so tainted with, with racism that it's, it's basically the cultural expectations are the, the root of all differences between people. And then that's perpetuated and reflected in the science. And, and then you could, and that's what many people think. And to me, that just sounds like a very far-fetched conspiracy theory. Okay, right. Well, it seems to me that you can say that race is, to some degree, a socially constructed phenomenon. Yeah. And, but it's, it's constructed on top of uh, diversity and uh, genetics that are distributed differently among different ethnic groups. So I do think that... Like, that doesn't seem unreasonable. Is that... Am I putting that fairly? I think, or? That's, I think that's fair. I think there are aspects of, of racial differences that are socially constructed. I do think that there are expectations put on people that they live up to. I think that if you moved to a different country... But, you know, you see similar ideas about what racial groups are like around the world, it could be possible if these things were totally socially constructed that you would see cultures in which there was a complete reversal of um, the hierarchy of, you know, of racial groups in terms of what people, who people thought would make the most money or would occupy positions of power. And this is where colonialism comes in. So in order to Mm. believe that racial differences are completely uh, socially constructed, and then also to think, okay, well, there are quite similar ideas about who is better and worse at various things around the world. Then you also have to introduce colonialism. Colonialism mm. tells you what to think about which races are better or worse. And then you have a social construction that is universal around the world that enables racial differences to be, you know, for you to say, okay, they don't exist at all other than in, in our minds. Now, but couldn't you argue that? if you look back at things like colonialism uh, and, you know, slavery, things like this, we know that genetics are activated differentially, right? Depending on the environment in which a child is born or whatever it might be. Right. So couldn't you argue that through several generations of uh, oppression that that would actually be affecting the genetics? Could that be it? Could Um, you make a case for that or no? So epigenetics thus far accounts for very little in terms of differences and it has just incredibly small effect but people really like it because it's a way that you can say environment alters genes so it's a way of saying both well we know that genes really matter and that a lot of things are actually very highly genetically determined but i'm going to compromise with you by saying the environment also causes a lot of these differences. And so therefore it's kind of nurture influencing genetics. But as someone said, epigenetics or reactive genetics, as it's sometimes called compared to actual genes compared to like GWAS or looking at adoption studies or twin studies accounts for, and I quote sweet fuck all, (laughs) you know, so it's really not as predictive. And the reason that people, people who are otherwise scientifically minded really like to, grab on to, to ideas and theories that are not particularly predictive. So for most people, an idea's scientific rigor is entirely dependent on how predictive it is in terms of outcome. And yet people really focus... I don't, intersectionality, in my mind, I have not seen any evidence that it has predictive power. I have not seen any evidence that you can go into a new culture and say, I'm going to be able to tell you through this lens of intersectionality yeah, I don't who's think on top and to. who's on bottom. I don't think it and, you know, to. scientifically, I'm going to be able to, to do that. Um, And so what happens is people, because it's more virtuous to believe the tenets of some ideas than others, they're willing to sacrifice that idea actually having any predictive power. Right, right. Okay. So, I mean, just, I guess going back to my original question, like the, the simple sort of who are these people online sort of aspect of the question. So it's, it, it's not like a, it's a a sort of legitimate field of debate and, and it's treated as such in, in the academic research on I mean, there this are people. There are people who are very well respected in terms of their scientific rigor, who 
who take risks, you know, Steven Pinker, um, who has said, actually, it's possible to believe in racial differences and, and not be a racist. And people have called him a racist all over the place for right. this reason. And so, uh, many people would say, there's no evidence at all that there are, that are, there are racial differences. Hmm. And they even, people have even railed against 23andMe for supplying ethnic origins because there is so much conflicting information with this idea that, you know, if you, if you commit a crime and you're on a crime scene, there are genes that you leave, you know, behind in blood samples or whatever that people can be able to tell if you're black or white, if you're redheaded or not, um, various things about you. And, you know, for a long time, people said, oh, you actually can't tell um, people apart racially by their genetics. Well, that's not true. You can. And there was a long time where you couldn't tell dog breeds apart based on their genetics. That was fairly recently that people have been able to do that. And But nobody would say that a... And, and people do get in a lot of trouble for comparing human beings to dog breeds. But there's dog breeds have been artificially selected to display certain kinds of personality traits. I don't think humans have... There's nobody who's artificially selected humans. But dog breeds do show you just how small a span of time you can fundamentally change the psychology of a wolf into something completely unrecognizable, completely different psychologically. Right. And you can do that pretty quickly, right? Like over not that many generations. They've done that in, uh, done that I think, with... 60 years with fox right. in, in, in Russia. They've made fox that cuddle with you, that wag their tails. And, you know, I've never really interacted with fox very much, but yeah. <laughs> but isn't that, isn't that evidence kind of on the side of the idea that there could be social and political factors that systematically shape different ethnic groups or different racial groups into fundamentally different attitudes, behaviors, capacities, isn't it? Or no? So there's this thing called the Baldwin effect. And the Baldwin effect is this idea right. that culture can actually shape genetics. And there's this group of people, now I can't remember, there's a, Na a Native American group, and they have a much higher rate of albinism. That there's a lot more albinos than there are in, the, in this Native American group than there are. And people have said it's because uh, albino men are not forced to work in the fields, they're allowed to stay back with the women all day. And of course, you know, th there's been whatever conflicting evidence about this or not. But in this particular case, you can say it's possible that the cultural rules around how to treat people with albinism have actually uh, propagated their, their spread. It's just, it's just statistics. It's just very, very straightforward. Um, but I will have to say, um, you know, I'd, I'd have to just say I'm agnostic about about whether or not that actually happens in practice. Okay, fair enough. Why did you chuckle when I asked? It's just simply easy. Like this is, uh, if you read stuff about you know Ashkenazi Jewish intelligence, people have made claims. I don't really know if this is the case or not, but people have said, okay, well, Ashkenazi Jews were pushed into a very specific profession, which was money lending. Mm -hmm. um, but also in you know Ashkenazi tend to be very sapiosexual, like your ability to you know, read Torah or recite or whatever is actually considered one of the more attractive qualities mm. you can have. I don't know how true that is. But so people have actually made this claim that the, the uh, that this actually drove intelligence. And also the fact that there was a lot of um, genetic separation or re reproductive separation from other kinds of groups. Uh, but this is the kind of thing that gets people in all kinds of trouble. And I actually don't know enough about it to say... Uh, I just know that that it does seem like there are groups who around the world have different aptitudes, and I don't know why that work, works the way it does. Yeah, no, fair enough. I have to pee. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> we, can, we, can, we can just wrap it up because it's five now. If you want. Yeah, cool. Cool. Well, I'll do it in a second. Right. So you were saying that um, that's sort of dangerous territory. What I was asking, but I was actually asking from the perspective of sort of like the like the lefty anti-racist um, kind of position that if there are uh, differences in aptitude that can be measured across ethnic or racial groups. Yeah. The idea that that could be caused by lo long periods of, of oppression. My point being uh, that okay. like what right wingers call fundamental genetic differences yeah. in these groups are actually caused by uh, unequal treatment in society over very, very long periods of time. So it seems to me like the, the studies on the foxes and these sorts of data points that we have about how quickly you know, uh, imposed environmental conditions over just a few generations can fundamentally alter, 
you know, um, how people behave or perform. Um, it seems kind of plausible. Uh, somebody has posited something like this. So there's a, a book called The Sun Also Rises, S-O-N, and there's also a book called Our Troublesome Inheritance by um, Nicholas Wade, which people have really maligned. But what he says is that um, there's about 600 years in Europe in which there was no social safety net. And if you were conscientious and hardworking, you had lots of kids because there was agriculture. So you could have six or seven kids. But if you weren't, then you and your kids died. Mm. And so this idea is that there was there was selection pressure for working hard and, and being conscientious during this time. Now, if I try and think about how racial oppression could naturally select or sexually select people. I mean, one, one interesting idea is there's an idea called assortative mating and it happens sure. more and more in, in society and especially with the advent of, of online dating, people are really choosing each other based on, on similarities. And so high IQ people end up with high IQ people. They have high IQ kids and there is a scramble, you know, for, for mates to a great extent. Now I can't actually think of a way off the top of my head that racial oppression could change who people decide to meet with other than that it would probably keep people from mixing. So for example, in Brazil, a lot of people are mixed race and there's actually, you know, unlike America where even saying, you know, uh, mulatto is a racist word in America and here in the UK, but it's not. In, in Brazil, because there are 30 or 40 different words to describe people's skin colors and things, to describe what people look like uh, racially. And I'm not saying Brazil's not racist, because it is, but um, there are, you know, descriptors of these things, and there is a whole lot of admixture. So I do think that you could see genetic effects insofar as people don't mix, um, but I don't actually see how racial oppression could make uh, people change genetically over time. I mean, certainly people have said, for example, that, you know, in the United States, uh, black people are much more at risk for hypertension than, than white people. And there was a, a medical trial that was done, uh, that said there is a drug that actually works on African American men better than it works on, on white men. I can't remember the specifics anymore. And people really said that we're, uh, we're upset about this, but that might be the, the process of a certain kind of, of natural selection such that, you know, during when, when slaves were shipped over from Africa, when they were you know, sold as property and when they were kidnapped from their homes, they had to actually be good at retaining water. Otherwise they would die of dehydration because they, they weren't given enough water. Hmm. I actually had this conversation with someone the other day and he really really reamed me for not describing this as violence enough. He was really upset with the way I described it, but hopefully I didn't describe it too passively. It mm. was a terrible thing that happened, but it sure. also, also involved some kind of selective uh, possible process. And what uh, people have said is that this might've had some influence on the salt metabolism of African Americans versus uh, um, white Americans. And even if you ask somebody, let's say I ask somebody who doesn't believe in racial differences at all, and I say, would you say that it would be good to do medical trials on just white people or somebody who says there aren't sex differences or psychological sex differences, then it should actually be fine to do medical trials on just white people or just black people or just women or just men. And you'd find the same results. And I think even the most hardcore kind of anti-biological differences person would say that that wouldn't be okay. And actually, I stole this from, from Jeffrey Miller, who um, says, you know, medical trials, um, of course, have to involve a diversity of people. I think that was a masterful uh, sort of expression of what you currently know about these things and, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and what you currently think about these things. Yeah. And I don't think you said anything that was too dicey or I didn't find I wasn't offended by anything you said. Well, in yes, any of thank that. you. <laughs> I, thought it was, I thought it was pretty measured and... Uh, it's all very interesting. I don't know enough about the research to yeah. to respond uh, intelligently or, or add anything to it, but yeah. um, thank you for that. That mm -hmm. was interesting. I'll have to go back and listen to everything mm -hmm. you said and, mm -hmm. and maybe do, do some reading up on it because it is definitely really interesting. Um, so I have you for a little bit more than uh, five more minutes. Yeah. So I want to <laughs> throw one more question on you. Sure. Um, 
and this is just going back to something that we talked about in a previous conversation, yeah. so, which is why I had it, have it in my mind. Um, this idea, you know, pretty controversial idea, but also in other ways, which we'll talk about, not so controversial, actually, yeah. um, about the relationship between transgenderism and mental health. Um, yeah. And so, right, so a, a very strong version of this claim is that transgenderism is kind of like an outgrowth or an effect of what are basically mental health it, it'll, problems. Yes. Yeah, so, um, and yeah. the, but a much more a, a much pared, more pared down version of the claim, which is I think like kind of uncontroversial, is that there's correlation, right? I and mean, in some sense, like uh, you can think of uh, just sort of you know gender dysphoria or something like that, right? As like a, you know the most basic kind of like feeling of wanting to have a different gender on some level can be thought of as um, some kind of malfunctioning. Um, potentially, right? Like some people will see it, can, can say that's just like a, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to describe because like, um, I'll just leave it at that. You, what, what do you think? Sure. So I just did a, a lecture on Thursday about paraphilias and transvestic fetishism is what is, you know, people cross-dressing and yes, people make a lot of corollaries between transgender now and homosexuality back in the you know 60s and 70s which previously homosexuality was in the diagnostics and statistical manual as a mental illness but the percentage of people who have been homosexual has been you know fairly consistent um even if you look at uh, kinsey he found a lot of people who were engaging in, in homosexual behavior and around the world people engage in homosexual behavior, usually alongside um, heterosexual behavior, whereas the frequency of people who identify either as neither gender or people who identify as a third gender or people who identify as the opposite gender than they were, uh, you know, assigned at birth or biologically is pretty small. And so it, it, it still is in the DSM, right now, who knows, you know, if it's going to be in the next uh, output. And one thing that seems pretty obvious on its face, but there's not great evidence about, is that it is the societal oppression and discrimination against mm -hmm. people who are gay and transgender right. that causes their greater suicidality and rates of depression. And I looked at some data, I, I actually tweeted this table, which showed that actually, if you look at people who pass and don't pass, so uh, people who said that they were always or often identified as the gender which which they identified. So let's say I'm a male to female trans man. or sorry, female to male trans man. Mm -hmm. So let's say I changed uh, my gender t to male. Um, if everybody saw me as male and I pass as a male, uh, the degree of people who had attempted suicide in that category was 46%. And if I had said people never or seldom saw, identified me as a male and I identify as a male or as a man, um, the rate of suicidality was also 46%. So perception and how you're treated does not appear to have an effect on... The, I mean, it was a small sample because nationals. transsexuals are, um, you know, trans people are a very small percentage of the population that, you know, might be a, a th not even a third of a percent. It might have actually gone up to, a, uh, you know, six-tenths of or two thirds of, of 1%, but that's still, it's, it's unclear, uh, you know, what percentage they are. So these were samples of, of hundreds of people. This is the best data I've seen for men who became women. The rate of suicidality for people who said they often passed was, um, 45% and the rate of suicidality in people who said they never passed was 40%. It's only a 5% difference. And then recently there was a big study that came out that said that gay marriage legalization in the United States has uh, decreased the suicidality of, of gay youth by 14%. If you look at the data, it's really, really messy. And they applied a model to it. Um, and I just read a blog that said, you know, it doesn't actually look, it's not like one of those effects that kind of hits you between the eyes. So while it seems super obvious from personal experience and from what we know about oppression and discrimination, that depression and suicidality might be caused by people being, you know, oppressed or, or discriminated against. I don't, you know, there's not actually good evidence for that yet, other than a priori, that's what you would expect. Hmm. Okay. That's interesting. So, I mean, there must be something, um, you know, if, if 
if trans people are having this huge rate of suicidality. And it actually doesn't make that much. So, I mean, in, in the study that I looked at, they did find a difference in, you know, people whose parents had stopped talking to them and whose parents had beaten them and stuff. But there's obviously genetic confounds for things like that. Um, the kind of people who have biological parents who beat them also might be the kinds of people who are predisposed to depression. It's never really clear when it comes to abuse um, where the genetic uh, confounds are. Okay, that's, that's definitely illuminating. And again, the reason I ask is because I, I don't know the research. I'm genuinely yeah. asking because I've yeah. heard about this idea and it's like obviously very controversial and, and on the face of it, can a lot of people see it as offensive. Um, so I was just curious what you knew about it. So again, I'll have to go back and listen to what you said because yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's rich. Um, the only thing I wanted to add is that, I mean, again, it's like this is one of those ideas that like people see as so offensive, like you're crazy and horrible if you even want to inquire about the relationship between transgenderism and mental health. Or even and, if you said that it's possible that discrimination actually doesn't cause the disparity and depression right. and suicidality. Yeah. Right. Or is um, that the main cause? But I just don't, I mean, I, I just don't find like the, inc- the question offensive, right? I mean, and on the, I mean, anyone like, especially in activist circles, I mean, it, it's like a, it's, it's, I don't know how to exactly put it, but, um, you know, it's somewhat anecdotal, but, um, you do observe correlations. I mean, correlations, which are not necessarily causations. What the causation is, I don't know. Mm. And I want to be perfectly clear, but you you can observe kind of troubling correlations between, uh, transgender people, uh, who are transgender and, and a variety of mental health issues. Mm. And like, it's because I am, totally supportive of trans people and gender autonomy. And I want people to do whatever the fuck they want yeah. with themselves. It's because I'm supportive of that and that I'm concerned and curious to know about like, what are the causal dynamics? What, um, you know, what I've seen recently that I think is, is very, you know, people are not being really specific enough is there's this, this whole debate now about whether or not, uh, people under the age of 18 or children should be able to transition. And on the one hand, um, there's this, there's these two things that people get confused a lot and they conflate a lot. There's desistance, which is somebody is convinced, a child is convinced that they would like to be, uh, a girl is convinced she would like to grow up to be a man or a boy is convinced that he would like to be, grow up to be a woman. And sometimes, and the people have kind of slandered this and called it conversion therapy, but some data shows that 80% of those kids end up deciding actually I'm going to end up Mm -hmm. growing up to be the, the, the gender that I was assigned at birth. Um, whereas if they actually go through a transition and they actually do transition, uh, medically, surgically, hormonally, they are generally, most of those people are actually happy with the gender that they become. And so there is this conflict, conflicted thing. Whereas, you know, many people would say, well, if you stay the gender that you were born, you're going to be more likely to, uh, pass. Uh, which, even though it, did, it doesn't actually seem to predict suicidality, it does seem to be important for people's well-being. Mm. And also, you'll be able to have kids. Because mm. uh, it's something people don't talk about a lot, because I think the left really undervalues how much people like to have kids and want to breed and, mm. and have a family, um, a, a, the, a biological family, not just uh, adopt kids. Um, uh because, I mean, obviously people who adopt kids are, are wonderful, but it, it, you do have a different bond with, with a child that comes out of you. Mm, sure. um, so distance and, and happiness with transitioning seem to be conflated a lot. And I can imagine that if I went through a whole process by which I was taking hormones, I went through surgery, etc., cetera, uh, I would probably end up being happy with what had happened because I had invested so much in it. And this is, this happens all the time. If I, if I pay a lot for something, I mean, this is actually part of the reason that hazing is effective. If somebody suffers Mm -hmm. to join a group, they actually are much more satisfied with being belonging in that group. And anyway, that's, that's my two cents about that. I just think that this is, this is something that people get confused about a, a lot and you have to consider, um, you know, if you're thinking about, uh, children transitioning, uh, how much is it going to harm them to possibly not pass and to never be able to have, uh, I mean, not all of them end mm-hmm. up sterile. There are people who don't end up sterile. Um, but yeah. 
super interesting and it's super complicated and you know, like super important, I think. So, I mean, yeah. we'll just pick this up next time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't want to abuse your time. No, it's um, fine. You have it. I had a great time. Diana, yeah. I want to say thank you for first receiving my unsolicited communications <laughs> on the internet so graciously and yes. in a friendly way. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. I just, I just don't know enough interesting people around, you know, South of England and we're just two, two loud mouthed Americans. So I'm really glad to have met you and, and hung out and had this conversation. Cool. Yeah. Well, I think you're very cool. Very thank smart. You. I think you said a lot of interesting things that I didn't find offensive. I, I mean, I, I don't think he's, <laughs> I mean, the internet might tell us otherwise, the internet but will tell us. <laughs> as far as I can tell so far, you didn't say anything that, uh, that like set off my like radar or, uh, you know, so cheers. Thank you. Yeah. It's been, it's been fun. Thanks, Justin. Let me hit this off.